I titled the talk uh, Silver Critical Metal and uh, Explosive Gains. So hopefully um, I'll manage to cover both of those topics relatively well. Um, an interesting development, in fact, I can't get into specifics, but just before, literally just before uh, coming up here in the last half hour or so, um, I got news that there are some serious efforts underway to get silver deemed a critical mineral in Canada, uh, as well as in the US. And that what we're talking about is mining companies uh, getting together, uh, providing serious research to uh, to Canada to, to explain really the reasons why it uh, deserves to be a critical metal. And I think that hopefully, um, as I touch on a couple of things, when we come to a demand for uh, the green transition, you'll see, uh, see what I'm talking about in terms of demand versus supply. So let's kick it off. I have a little bit of macro view first. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but... Um, we talk about the uh, the risk of recession. As far as I'm concerned, it it um, whether it's here or, uh, here or not yet, it's absolutely coming, and it's very likely to be a hard landing. If you look at the last nine rate hiking cycles, only two of those have managed to be what we call soft landings, and so that's a 20-ish percent uh, rate. I don't think that the odds are in the Fed's favor this time, and um, so that's certainly uh, my view. Total assets of the uh, of the Fed, they've certainly been tightening, tightening pretty aggressively from almost nine trillion two years ago to about seven and a half trillion now. Um, there's a lag effect. I think that that combined with the the, uh, the the tightest rate hiking cycle that they've that we've had um, is going to kick in in a big way. And another reason why I think we're looking at um, a full blown recession. There's eight trillion dollars of U.S. Treasury debt maturing this year alone, and uh, the Fed's been uh, sorry. The Treasury's been criticized for not issuing enough long-term debt when rates were low. So it would not surprise me now to see Yellen um, take that up, especially as rates get pulled back and make up for that. However, even if the Treasury starts to issue a lot more debt on the long end those rates are going to be a lot higher than they were a couple of years ago. So that's just adding to, uh, that's just adding to the inflation um, issue and to the, uh, to the sizes of the deficits and, and, and so on. And so I really think that uh, they're compounding the problems that are already bad enough. Switching gears a little bit, um, I really do think that we're in a, uh, in a commodity decade uh, right now. And this is a, an excellent contrarian point. Uh, there was a, a survey by Bank of America. They looked at fund managers and they asked them what their um, exposure was to commodities versus bonds. And we're at uh, a low, uh, the lowest point that we've been since March of 2009. So they're the most underweight bond, uh, sorry, commodities right now versus bonds. Tremendous contrarian um, indicator. One of my favorite charts I put together, I looked at the last few years of the silver price. That's that gray line. You've got the orange line, which is the Fed funds rate. So the reason I, I put this together, what I thought to myself, I'm curious to see how silver has behaved since that uh, rate hiking cycle kicked in. So that green line, the green dotted line is actually when the Fed started hiking rates. So early of 2022. And as you can see in that yellow shaded area, that's the silver price since then. And yes, it corrected a little bit since at that point over the next several months. And then yet, really, it's, it's managed to stay in a pretty, uh, pretty reasonable range. Uh, it's not a tight range, but it has been roughly between, say, 20 and 26 or $28 since then. It's certainly, even as the hikes continued higher, it actually trended back higher and then moved sideways. So that's actually quite, uh, quite uh, bullish and quite uh, reassuring in terms of how silver has reacted to uh, such uh, such a you know a strong rate hiking cycle. Now again, switching gears, we're looking at uh, global demand for sil silver annually, and as you can see, from about 2010 to about 2020, it was pretty much level. And in the last three years, it's really bumped up. Um, we've ha we had a record year. In fact, 
the last three years, any of those years are, are records compared to the average of the prior 10 years. We've had a little bit of a pullback last year. And if you dig deeper, which uh, I'll get to on another slide, what the underlying reasons are for that, it's actually not that surprising. Uh, but just to show you that we're really in, an, in a new phase demand wise when it comes to silver. Silver supply is looking like it has peaked. Again, uh, Bank of America did a survey of the 13 largest primary silver producers and asked them where they thought mine supply was going. And, they, and on average, they thought that we were not going to revisit the peaks of 2016 where we had 900 million ounces of silver from mining anytime soon. So this chart actually goes out to the end of next year and it's essentially flat over the last five, six years or so. Despite record demand in silver, we actually had a shrinkage of 18 million ounces last year in supply. That's about 2%. The Silver Institute thought that um, supply would actually be up. In fact, it was down. And as I say, again, keep in mind, in the face of record growing demand for silver, and it's really across the, across the world, there are a couple of places that are, uh, are having more challenges than others. Again, mine su supply at best is flat. That uh, oval on the right side shows you a couple of projects that are coming online. One's in Russia, have to see how that pans out. One is in Bosnia, that's likely to go ahead. And um, then we've got the bottom one is um, Terra Nera, that's Endeavor Silver. That doesn't even kick in until the very end of this year. Uh, from what I know, that purple circle at the bottom is in uh, is in Peru uh, not supplying at all right now uh, offline and so as I say uh, you've got some companies that are actually ramping up they are by far the exception and so again at best we're lucky if we can manage to keep mine supply flat here is where a lot of this shrinkage of supply is coming from Mexico, was actually, which is the world's largest silver producer, was actually down 12% last year. A lot of that has to do with, uh, with Newmont's Penasquito mine, which was offline for something like four months due to a strike. We have Peru, which between Peru and China, they're, it's hard to be sure who's number two, but the numbers out of Peru tend to be easier to rely on. With that in mind, Peru has actually seen its mine supply shrink for the last six or seven years. We're down to levels of 20 years ago. This is in the world's uh, arguably number two supplier of silver. And here are some of the reasons that it's hard to make uh, the silver mining industry look attractive to, to miners. The first year, first half year costs in 2023 were 50 57% higher than they were in 2022. So we're looking at things like inflation, we're looking at things like um, currency exchanges that are making uh, local currencies more expensive. Silver is sold in US dollars, so if you're mining in Mexico and your, your costs go up, then you're at a disadvantage and that just makes your uh, cost of production go up. Another point that some of you may have seen, but 25%, uh, only 25%, of mine, mine supply comes from what we call primary silver mines. So about 75%, three quarters of all silver that's mined is actually a byproduct of mining other metals, gold, copper, lead, and zinc. If we, it, when we move into a recession, and if base metals start to pull back in terms of production, it's much easier to, to slow down a mine than to try to ramp one up. Um, and if that pulls back, then odds are we're going to actually get less silver because as I say, three quarters of silver from mining comes from mining other metals. So look for more pressure on silver supply, mine supply. So the Silver Institute sees deficits persisting. We've had in the last three years, we've had deficits. Um, if you add up those deficits for the last three years, you're actually looking at almost 500 million ounces. That's about an, half of an entire year's supply of silver just undersupplied by the market. So people will ask, well, 
you know, you've got to, the silver's got to come from somewhere if people are actually using it and the industry's not supplying it. So there are these, what I call secondary supplies. Uh, other than mining or recycling, you've got people who are perhaps selling their holdings back into the market. You could have ETFs that are, uh, if, if uh, they're selling in the ETF space, some of the ETFs that hold the silver that goes back into the market. You have uh, people taking delivery on futures contracts. If you add all that up, there is supply that is uh, meeting that demand, uh, but nobody knows exactly what the above ground supplies are. You'd have to assume a few billion ounces, but in three years, we worked through half of uh, a billion ounces. So you'd have to imagine that that can really only go on so long. Bank of America, once again, uh, did some research and they looked at critical metals um, in, uh, again, because of the uh, energy transition. And they looked at things like copper, nickel, zinc, cobalt, lithium. And it turns out that out to 2030, silver had the single biggest supply forecast supply deficit of any of the metals that were critical to the um, to the energy transition. So that really says a lot about how how crucial uh, mine and uh, supply overall for silver would be. So I was saying earlier that we saw overall demand come down a little bit last year for silver. And if you if you drill down a little bit and look at some of the reasons why that is, the three categories, subcategories that uh, that actually were down were silver jewelry, um, silverware, and net physical investment. And actually, in 2023, they had come off absolute all-time record years in 2022. So it's not, as I say, it's not that surprising that last year it kind of reverted back to the mean and we were more at, at more normal levels. India was a big, big uh, buyer in 2022 and really pushed these levels to, uh, to record highs. So I actually personally think that, especially on the uh, physical side, physical uh, net investment side, we're gonna see uh, a considerable bounce back this year back to recession, people are gonna look for a safe haven. We're gonna take away the opportunity cost of owning a, a metal versus owning bonds, for example, or even stocks. So uh, that should help make uh, investing in silver more attractive once again. Industrial demand. The Silver Institute forecast early last year that industrial demand would grow by 4%. They revised that in November. It actually doubled the growth rate to 8%. Industrial demand last year was over 600 million ounces out of a billion ounce market. So the industrial side of silver really is taking on a lot of importance versus the, the, uh, the investment side of it. And I'm not saying that's going away, but, um, but, but certainly the industrial side, uh, the industrial demand side is growing a lot. And I like to say that industrial demand provides a rising, a steady rising floor under the silver price. And it's the investment demand that when that kicks in, that's the wild card that helps to create these rallies and these spikes in the silver price. And that's uh, what you really want to, to be exposed to. And uh, interestingly enough, solar, uh, the Silver Institute had said that solar would require 161 million ounces last year. Uh, they ended up revising. I'd been saying since middle of last year uh, that it would actually be closer to 180 to 190 million ounces of silver. And when they revised their numbers back in November, they said, not specifically, but you can do the math and figure it out. So they said 632 million ounces of industrial demand, 30% of that was solar alone, which translates to 191 million ounces, I think. So it was at the upper end of, of my forecast. Um, I think we're gonna see that maintain itself, even if it's not likely, but even if solar production were flat next year, and even for several years, the technology is changing. And if you look back just four years, the two newer technologies, so the most uh, popular or the most, uh, the incumbent technology for the last several years has been something called PERC. The next two in terms of uh, output, energy output are Topcon. Topcon takes 50% more silver per panel. And then HJT, which takes up to 150% more silver per panel. So four years ago, the, the two newer technologies that take more silver represented 
of the uh, manufacturing capacity. Last year, they already represented 35% of manufacturing capacity. The Silver Institute is forecasting that Topcon, again, the one that takes 50% more silver per panel, is going to represent 50% of manufacturing capacity in 2024. And that line on the right is what we call um, silver loadings. So that's the amount of silver that's required per panel. I believe that it's, you, we can see that it's flattened in the last couple of years. I believe that we're at an inflection point now, especially with these newer technologies being very quickly adopted. The amount of silver that's gonna go into each solar panel is absolutely going to start trending up very quickly. Energy Information Administration, I hope I have that right talks about tax incentives for solar. And if you compare solar to other energy sources, they actually are much, much more supportive of solar versus other uh, forms of energy. In 2022, solar got 302 times more in tax incentives than um, nuclear and 136 times more than oil and gas. So as you can see, governments are very, very much behind solar. Um, the uh, energy information, sorry, the, uh, there's another uh, agency, I forget the name exactly, but they were forecasting that by uh, 2027, so we're talking only three years out, solar will be the world's largest source of energy. It'll surpass uh, uh, coal and natural gas. So really, uh, solar is absolutely taking over in many, many places. It's the cheapest form of new energy to add to your grid. Just to give you a little bit of uh, updates in terms of developments in, on the technology side, silver being um, important to, uh, to the transportation side and th this transition towards uh, green, uh, green energy. We know that silver is important in things like um, electronics, so it's, it's all over in, in cars and whether they be EVs or, or regular internal combustion engines, but there was some research put out recently by Toyota along with uh, Stanford, and they found a way to make the, the, uh, the fuel cells uh, much cheaper. So what they've, the, one of the big costs in a fuel cell is the platinum group metals that are used in the anodes. So they figured out a way to replace that with silver. They found that this new application uh, way of getting that onto the, uh, the anodes. So that could dramatically drop the cost for um, hydrogen fuel cells. And we could look at that perhaps being much more quickly, quickly adopted as a, as a uh, transportation uh, technology. Looking at um, the uh, the technical side of, of pricing and and, uh, and uh, relationships with ratios and other metals, I believe first of all that we're in a long term a downward trend in the uh, in the U.S. dollar. This shows us that there's a pretty high correlation between the gold silver ratio and the U.S. dollar. Now, the gold silver ratio compares how many ounces of silver it takes to buy an ounce of gold. And when the ratio falls, that tends to actually be good for both metals, except that silver catches up uh, or tends to rise more quickly than gold does. So if when we see the, the dollar fall, we see the ratio fall. Again, that's good for, for silver as well as for gold. So, as I say, if you look back over the last sort of 40 years or so, you see that the, the US dollar index has been in a very long-term downtrend. Each successive peak has been lower. And if that continues, and I certainly do think it will, I think we're gonna probably within the next year or so. Right now, the, the index is at about 103. If we see that, um, I think we're gonna see that probably bottom somewhere around uh, 90 at least or so in the next uh, year, year and a half. So if that's the case, that's very bullish for uh, the precious metals, silver in, in particular. This is the Silver Juniors ETF to the silver price. And to just give you some idea of how explosive it could be, um, at the end of 2015, the ratio made a, a, a long-term bottom. And then in 2016, Silver Juniors absolutely exploded higher. And then we've gone through this multi-year period now, again, with the ratio has been falling, falling, falling. And now I think that we've hit a new low, a higher low. Time will tell. But if that's the case, we could very well be looking at an explosive uh, potential upside again in the silver juniors. And here's what happened in 2016. Silver was up 40%, and I'm not talking about individual names. This is an ETF of silver juniors. The silver juniors were up eight times 
over the amount that silver was up. They were up 320%, and this was in a seventh month time frame. So that gives you some idea of just how explosive uh, the silver uh, equity space can be. Discoveries are rewarded. It's been a challenging year or two years in this space. Um, this is a chart for Hercules Silver. They had a discovery back in uh, October of last year. Stock went from 30, 40 cents all the way to $1.50. It's back down now uh, considerably. But just to tell you that uh, uh, if you make a, a good discovery, the market will notice. And then you don't have to play in the most uh, risky uh, part of, the, uh, of this space back in uh, a couple of examples here, but the one on the right is wheat and precious metals back in from about November 20, uh, 2008 to April of 2018. Wheat and precious metals is up 1700%. So that's two and a half years in one of the largest uh, silver, uh, silver companies out there. And I think technical pressure is building in the silver price. What you see on the right, from my view, reflects quite a bit what we saw back in late 2008 and then you saw the silver price absolutely explode if that happens again we could be well north of 30 dollars in, in silver in almost no time so there's silver really is uh, benefiting from two mega trends i wish i could take credit for for that idea but we all know it um but it's a guy eric strand from auag funds out of sweden and he's basically saying these two mega trends are currency debasement, so printing of money, and the green transition. So there are really some very, very big uh, um, pressures that are pushing silver uh, potentially a lot higher. Have a game plan. Um, equities are massively underpriced. Take your time, do some research, and then look for the best of the best. Scale in, quality management, great uh, projects that are well cashed up. And I'm going to wrap it up. Um, Silver Stock Investor, Ben mentioned what I do. It's a newsletter, the only newsletter that's focused exclusively on silver investments. All my thoughts on silver and I cover the entire space and I give you um, my macroeconomic view and I do uh, some uh, proprietary research on silver as well every month. Uh, that's how you can follow me. And I wrote a book called The Great Silver Bowl that gives you uh, an overview of the entire uh, opportunity in silver, a generational opportunity. And that's, I guess, I feel the best sort of introduction to, to silver and how to get, uh, to get invested in this space. Thanks very much for your time.